Hey mate! Oh. What's going on in here? Kappa? Be a man. Become a legend. Like the wizard. Make the switch today to Beard and Blade. This autumn, Milwaukee Tool has you covered with a comprehensive lineup of pro grade chainsaws and hatchets designed to tackle any cutting task with ease. No pull starts, no petrol fumes, no downtime for ongoing engine maintenance. Find your closest authorised trade partner today at milwaukeetool.com.au and experience the power and performance for yourself. Milwaukee, nothing but heavy duty. This episode is also brought to you by our friends at Beard and Blade, Australia's largest online men's grooming company. With over 1 million website visits, 500,000 satisfied customers, and their extensive range of products. From razors, beard oils, shaving creams, to skincare and hairstyling products. Making them your one-stop shop for all your manly grooming needs. Simply visit beardandblade.com.au and make the switch today to Beard and Blade. Another massive guest today and plenty more to come. So make sure you're subscribed if you haven't already. Righto, let's get straight into the show. Why are you nervous? <laughs> oh, this is just so weird. Like, this is like normal when we talk on the phone. It's, it's always just like, normal. Yeah, here. I know, but now it's like we're in a van outside my house. My mum's <laughs> taking photos from the sliding door. <laughs> Such a different experience. Your mum's all over it. She's all over it. She's all. She did li- feedback. What'd she say before? What your friend said, there needs to be a mascot or something in here. Yeah, they you want need a, a mascot. They want more buzz braid and I think the curtains are a bit flying. We I need think, a- I'm surprised you don't have... I thought you had like a cap or you had something that was like well, a mascot. Well, this is Roland Media's van. So we we obviously use um, this one, but it's hard to customise. Like we'd have to put something up on the on the curtains there. I feel like- I was hoping you'd bring in a Mercedes sign or something. I was going to throw it up. I'll give you- I can give you- You know, every person that comes on the podcast should like give you a memento to like add to the van or something. Yeah, I think with a studio, that's what I want to do. Like it's a jersey or something and then you can just add something. But if I did that, I'd have to fill the- the old Johnny the Jeep up with a lot of little toys Johnny there. The Jeep. Still can't, going the Jeep. Can't believe it. You did the finance have, on that, I have, think. Have you changed the uh, the registration plates on that yet, or is it still WA? Oh, I don't, I don't know. Oh, well, now you, you put me on the pub, it's, it's still WA. Sorry. <laughs> it's sitting right there. When did you leave WA? Oh, well, technically right now it's still there. Still um, there, still there, still there. Anyone <laughs> who's watching there, from the six big months roads. of the year, yeah, you've just thrown me under the bus. Okay. Um, when did I leave WA? 2019, I think they gave me the arse. Well, that's when I left, so that probably yeah. makes a little bit of sense. <laughs> and then I was in Sydney with them for two years. Oh, my God. Driving around the streets and then now uh, back here. The Jeep's doing well, though. It's a great car, 10 years in, so I'm glad I picked that one. I think, you, as I said, I think you helped me finance that one, which finance is great. Finance and logbooks, you know, it's all about that depreciation, get that value. People out here might not, listening and watching, <laughs> might not understand. So, Mel, you used to look after, uh, you used to work at Connor Sports Management, you used to look after me, look after Toby, Rory, you know, Paddy Dangerfield, the list goes on. Obviously, mm-hmm. Connor Sports Management with Paul and Robbie now and, and the team, but, you know, it's a big team and a big pool of players. That's how we know each other very well. Mm-hmm. And everyone out there that's probably wondering um, who Mel is, that's who. That's how we got to meet. But now you're at Mercedes F1. You've been there for three years. I want to start on that because it just happened. And Mercedes comes second. Yeah. Lewis comes second. Yeah. Bit of drama with um, Russell. What's Georgie? Yeah. What, what happened with him? And he obviously had to come out of the race early, but second for the team was the vibes up and about, talk yeah. to us about, we're going to go right into the F1 journey and what your role is, but just stay on F1 Melbourne, your first one with the team. Yeah. How was it? Yeah, it was great. I mean, Melbourne, Melbourne in general for sport is such a vibe here and it was like, it's buzzing, right? Like this time of year, footy's back, weather's really good. And I think, you know, since Netflix Drive to Survive has happened mm. more and more, Aussie fans are like really up and about it. Like, you know, I grew up with F1, my dad's Austrian, my kind of heroes growing up were the Michael Schumachers of the world and Valentina Rossi's. So I was four wheel and two wheel kind of girl. We didn't have footy growing up in my family because no one, no one like my dad's Austrian, my mum's Singaporean. So footy kind of was like a secondary love that kind of came F1 and, and MotoGP was the first. So, you know, when I was growing up, no one really understood why F1 was, you know, exciting and thrilling. And 
you know, I was the person that was buying general admission tickets and sitting on the hill when I was like a teenager when it came. Um, so now it's like amazing to see that that's like 400 and what is it? 445,000 people came to the Melbourne Grand Prix. It sold out in three hours. Like it's so exciting for the sport. I think it's done so much for us as a country, but also I think also the drivers we've got, you know, Oscar Piastri, who's a driving for McLaren, who's another Australian who's in, who doesn't love Danny Rick. So it is exciting that more and more people are excited about F1. So of course, to be home for the first, like my first home race with the team was pretty cool. I didn't realize you were such a fan growing yeah. up. Yeah. I used to like wake up, I think like the F1 kind of starts at random time. So it'd be like 11 PM, 1 AM. And I would like, they, th my Sunday nights would be Arsenal and F1 or MotoGP. And then I'd get into the office on Monday and Paul would grill me and be like, why are you watching this? It's so boring. <laughs> and then now he's like, can you get me tickets to the race on the weekend? <laughs> so, you know, times have changed. But yeah, it's been a big part of like my family for a long time. So it's kind of cool to to be there now. That's epic. That's even more special considering now you roll at Mercedes. What is your actual title? If I went on LinkedIn, give me the title. That on LinkedIn, I'm a partner manager. So I look, I'm in the sponsorship division. I look after the lifestyle partners that the team and I um, it's kind of a relationship role. So yeah, as you know, I love talking to people, yeah. meeting people. So yeah. yeah. You'd be doing that very well there. And just like perks of the job with that one, what are some of the coolest acts of activations you put together the, in F1 that maybe you couldn't have done in AFL uh, so far in your three years? Um, so yeah, sponsorship, I guess, in Formula One or overseas is really different to Australia. Um I think one of the biggest ones last year was Miami. I think everyone went big for Miami. Um, was lucky enough to work with one of our partners, IWC, on an activation with Tom Brady and Lewis Hamilton where they played charity golf um, and then they kind of came to the race after. So it was it was pretty amazing. I know Tom is one of your one of your boys. And I know how you just thought about this you. one down, just like <laughs> hanging out with Tom Brady and Lewis Hamilton, you know, putting together the golf yeah. day. That He is the GOAT, really. That must have been, <laughs> I mean, that must have been something else. I mean, I'm not the biggest NFL fan. I know that's, it's your bread and butter, but um, Tom's, Tom was really lovely. Good to have him at the track. And I mean, F1 brings all sorts of, you know, personnel to to the races. And sometimes you just pinch yourself and go, wow, this is pretty cool. And it looked like following the sport of NFL, he's an intense kind of dude, but at the F1 in Miami, that's like his time where he really relaxes. It looks like anyway, he's, yeah. swat, you know, he's, he's strutting around, he's yeah. dressed sharp. You would have got the best version of Tom Brady. He would have been very relaxed. I'd imagine. Um, yeah, so t what, give me an, any encounters. I know you sent me some photos, you're smoke bombing, you're getting photos with Tom, you're walking him in the track. Any other uh, any other encounters? No, like, I mean, Miami was such a blur because it was so busy. I think, you know, you couldn't walk from our team hospitality to the garage. It was just so busy. I think a cameraman nearly took me out because he was trying to film Tom walking from one end, um, end to the other. Um, but, I don't, like, you know, there was the – my – photo bomb moment when I didn't realize that I'd probably photo bombed one of the most iconic photos um, with Lewis and Michael Jordan, David Beckham and Tom. So, I mean, again, I'm not about the, the celebrity kind of that, thing. But I but fucking like am. I am. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to those names like David Beckham, Lewis Hamilton, Michael Jordan and Tom Brady. And then you're just in the background. I, I think I was in the background just freaking out that someone was going to crush one of the car parts behind me. And I was getting a bit angry that everyone was there. And then I'm, I think, I mean, I just look like a sitting duck in that. I was like, oh my God. Or something, I yeah. didn't even realize. And then someone, someone sent it to me because I think it's on, I can't remember who posted it. Probably boss and they were, and they were like, oh my God. And I was like, oh my God. It's like one of those moments when you're like, I wish I wasn't in the background. But anyway, but yeah, no, um, Miami, Miami always brings, I think like a, like a array of NBA stars, NFL stars. Mm. I think again, like with drive to survive more and more people are becoming excited about the sport and coming. So, you know, it's very, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, you look at the, I think, what is it? The grid when they come into like Austin on those, US races, there's just so many celebrities there. So Oh yeah, everyone's there. And a, and a Drive to Survive has been amazing. You're seeing all these docos come out now yeah. that are just promoting the sport. It's awesome. Everyone wants to get to know the drivers, the people behind, you know, Mercedes or Red Bull or whoever. It makes it way more thrilling when you rock up to the track because you feel like you know them. They don't know you, but you feel like you know yeah. a little bit more about their strategy, even though it's delayed. Yeah. Uh, it gives everyone a bit more insight and and even me, I think we were in the hub 2020 and that's when we were all obsessed because there was nothing else to really do and to be on it, Gosh, you know, God. like 10 o'clock, you might get a race in and, and um, everyone would get around each other. So pretty exciting. You've jumped on at a great, like I feel like society is, you know, with Drive to Survive, that's mm -hmm. when you kind of started, wasn't it? Like 
I think I came maybe a year or two after. So I joined, I left after the grand final in 2019 and I didn't have a job for like two and a half, three months. And then I started in January, 2020, which obviously was a bit of an unconventional start because, um, the world kind of went into that lockdown for about six months and there was no F1 for nine weeks. And I was like, Oh my God, I'm the last one in, I'm going to be the first one out sort of thing. And very lucky and blessed that I, that didn't happen. Um, but I've, you know, my dream job was to kind of land into Formula One or into English Premier League because I always think you need to be passionate about the sport or where you're waking up to go to work every day. So, yeah, I'm pretty lucky that I landed where you I clocked, wanted to land. You clock Connor Sports Management. You've managed every <laughs> manager. You've, you've managed every gun in the – sure about in, that. Not clock, but you've, you've, you've done a lot in the sport. We're going to go back to talk about – you growing up um, as a young girl, and then into you know, and then a, and then a, you know, one of the first really trailblazing for female player agents. There's not many when you started, um, but before we go there, just in F1, um, like how challenging was it to get the job? Like I remember, I actually caught up with my mate Lee today, uh, yesterday, oh, yeah, 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 who I was linking you with. When you're yeah. like Tommy, I don't, I'm, I'm, I'm cooked here. I've got no yeah. job. I'm like, what can I do? You know, yeah. I'm reaching out to everyone. He goes, I got a contact at Haas, and then he was like. Because he asked me what I'm doing tomorrow. I said, I'm catching up with you. And he goes, oh, mate, she's killing it. Okay, do you remember the time I was going to link her up with Haas? And then she goes, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm at Mercedes. <laughs> I, got the, I got an interview at Mercedes. Like, But go back because people, a lot of people out there do look like, you know, move on from a job because they go chase their dreams. And yeah. you, you've literally packed up in Melbourne. You're single. You've hit London. with no, You don't really have many contacts over there, maybe a couple. Yeah. Uh, but you, you were struggling there for a bit to find, you know, just a, an in. Yeah. How were those? times i'm talking from like when you landed to london before you even got a foot in the door in an interview like how tough were some of those times it was really tough um you know i think i was in footy for 11 and a half years and you think about the network that footy brings is just like i had you know you could call you never get bored in melbourne because you could always call one of you guys and you'd be around and you can catch up and you know you know someone you know so you, and, and it goes on from there um london was a whole kettle of different kettle of fish i think you know we talked about it for a long time, but five, six years before I actually left, I probably tried to do that in reverse and try and get a job whilst being here still and then go. People don't take you seriously, I think, because we're so far away and, you know, there's the visa issues and things like that. So I was like, okay, I tried it once. If I'm going to go and do this properly, I need to pack up and leave and show people that I'm serious. Um, so, I mean, I was, I'm not going to lie, probably for a month I did, I was like, yeah, I'm partying. When I was like, Oktoberfest, I was in London. It was off season for you guys. There was a ton of like Connor's boys that were in, in London that I could kind of hang out with and distract myself. But then, you know, when they left, I was like, right, I don't have a network here. I don't know anybody here. Um, how am I going to find, you know, a way to kind of meet people and get a job? And, you know, I was quite happy to work behind a bar for a while or go do something else. Like I'm always a believer of, you know, if you want it, you got to work hard and you got to start somewhere. Um, but it was really difficult. Like I was lucky, like obviously I met Lee. Um, I met another guy called Tom who's now at Football Federation Australia, but you know, he kind of linked me in with a couple of people as well. But really the how I got to Merck was um, a bit of a different story. So in about, I think it was like 2016 or 2017, I went to a Red Bull racing um, F1 party here before the Grand Prix started. And as you know, I talked to the likes of Puma, Adidas and Nike quite regularly because I needed to put boots on all of you boys and make sure you didn't have to pay for them. <laughs> um, so Puma, um, Sean Trenton there um, kindly invited me to the party and just said, oh, you know, you've always wanted to get into Formula One. So why don't you come to this party and see, you know, who you can meet? Um, and I was really lucky. I met Jamie and Greg at Puma who work for the motorsport, um, for motorsport in Puma and HQ over there. Is that and what you met at Crown the other night? Yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, so they're the guys. Yeah, correct. Yeah. So um, they, Jamie kind of just said, you know, what do you want to do with life? Where do you want to end up? And I just kind of said, oh, you know, these are all the things that I do as a player agent. Like, where do you think I could fit? And, you know, when someone says like, send me your CV and, you know, I'll send it on, you, you really do don't like nine times out of 10, I don't think people really do that. Um, but Jamie bless him really did. And I got an email from, um, my boss who was at the time she just left recently, but she sent me an email saying, Oh, we've got a job opening and you've, we've been passed on your details from Jamie. Like if you want to come and apply, like, you know, here's a link sort of thing. Um, long story short, I didn't obviously get that role at the time, but then I kind of just stayed in contact with her over like the next three 
like three years basically. So I think the next year I reached out to her, I went and had a coffee with her and kind of just, you know, I always think face to face is so much better than you can't get, you can't convey experience or personality on a CV. I think personality and face to face is in, in any kind of relationship management is super important. So I went and met her then and then, you know, nothing eventuated um, after that, I think my mom got sick. So I kind of just stayed, it's only me and my mom over here in Melbourne. So I stayed here for a couple more years. And then when I finally decided to take the leap of faith and leave, I sent them a message and said, Hey, I've moved. Is there any chance we could have a coffee? And then they were like, yeah, of course, come and see us in three weeks. And then two days later they popped a job up and the rest is history. That's bang. That is so good. So there you go. That's actually well done again. It's so, it's so cool. So many people need to hear these stories because they are you know, they, they might be looking for their dream job and they're a bit scared to leave. The three weeks of waiting, were you like, was that, was that tough? Or oh, did you have yeah. a good feeling like, oh, that, you know, that went pretty well? Uh, it was, it was pretty stressful. Like I, I mean, when somebody offers you, I think, I know this is, sounds probably a little bit lame, but I remember going to like Bali at the end of 2018 and I said, I'm going to do a week and I'm going to write down all the people that I kind of wanted to work for. And Mercedes was on that list. And, you know, in those kind of moments, you don't think you're, I'm in the furthest point away from, from home in the world, basically in Melbourne, where I want to be able to work is on the other side of the world. I don't know anyone. F1 feels like such an exclusive place to be able to, you know, get in the door so to be able to get there was like, or even have the interview or the opportunity was like, oh my God. At the same time, I was still applying for other jobs. I remember I wrote a list of all the places I applied. I think I applied for 15 jobs and mm. no one got back to me except for Mercedes, obviously. So, so good. Yeah. There you go. You got to bang the door down, don't you? <laughs> you got to bang the door <laughs> well, down. If you want it, you got to work hard for it, It's right? not lame. I think visualizing where you want to be, it happens all the time. Yeah. I tell people that all the time. I think, how'd you do that? Well, I, I always thought I could do it. I knew, I, like, you know, it, it might not come off, but yeah. you, you definitely know that if you do everything you can to, to you know, to get it done, yeah. generally something happens. It might not even be what you're after, but then you meet someone else. And it's funny how you met him at a party. Oh, I reckon you always meet someone on the piss. You always do. I think sometimes, like, I think some of the best deals I ever did was like when I was out, like, you know, sponsorship deals with, was like with you guys, like it was just people, I think are more relaxed and you're just more open and transparent and you kind of agree where you want to get to. And then it kind of gets done. And I think I always say like when people used to like message me on LinkedIn and stuff and say, how did you get your job? Or, you know, what's your, what's your advice? My advice has always been like, always have a coffee with someone because you never know where that person's going to end up, or where that person's going to help you. And it might not be, they might not be in that job now, but you never know where they're going to be in five or 10 years time. And mm. that's how you build your networks. And now I'm really lucky. I've got a, an amazing network in the UK that can now, you know, when other people come over, we link them to with each other. So mm. it's really important. You, your network in, in this kind of, in sport is everything. Yeah, it's great. It's great advice. You've saved me asking you a question. <laughs> What's your greatest advice? That is amazing advice. Just that yeah. face-to-face catching up. And if you catch up with the right people, as you said, if they if their careers progress, they're going to introduce you to their network and it makes things a little bit easier. Yeah. Um. So cool. Yeah, it is cool. Do you pinch yourself a little bit? Like, I know it's a cliche, but you, once you get the dream job, you kind of just, you know, you, you're trying to maximize your day. You want to be 1% better every day. You kind of just go, not going through the motions, but you do forget to just sit back and reflect. Like, are there times like this that you've just had the Grand Prix in Melbourne where you go far out? Like, I'm, this is amazing. Like, I'm a part of this. Yeah. No, I mean, I think we're all very guilty of like, we never celebrate the wins enough, right? And I definitely didn't do it enough when I was at Connors and I probably still don't do it enough here. I'm probably, we're all our own biggest enemy sort of thing. But like, even though coming home, like in the last two weeks and like running into half the Connors list and seeing everybody like makes me, makes me really homesick because like, you know, we were family for like over a decade. Right. And I still talk to quite a few of you when you were overseas and stuff, but then they like, those are the moments that I kind of really appreciate. I, I probably reflect way too late down the track, but then yeah. I always come back and go, you know, like when I was little, this is what I wanted. This is always what I wanted to do. When I was in high school, I wanted to be a player agent. So it's just kind of like being able to say like the things I wanted to do. I'm like, yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty cool. But then I'm, I'm a bit like, I have to move on to the next thing and how can I keep getting better? Yeah. So I don't really sit in those moments as enough as I probably should. Yeah. It's a real Australian cultural thing, isn't it? We don't really talk ourselves up. We just kind of move on to the next thing where in America, that's the opposite. They're really up and about and pump each other up. So it's just, we probably should celebrate the wins more, you know, more often, to be honest. Um, well done. It's great. How many messages did you get from 
I made sure I didn't message her. I, I, everyone's like, Mel got your tickets. I said, I'm just this year, I'm biting the bullet. Next year, I'm going to hit her with pace. <laughs> no, no, I had a couple of messages, but you know, it's not like footy. You can't just, um, oh, no, you I can't just that. pluck tickets around. But yeah, there was a couple of interesting messages that slipped Actually, into I the did DMs. send you a message on the Sunday. Where's the after party? Because the team comes second. But oh yeah, I think I was nowhere. You, you after got that. back to me a bit too late. <laughs> uh, let's go back to go forward. Let's talk about you growing up because, uh, like I said, it's not that easy to crack AFL, um, the AFL player agent space. Not now anyway. Back then would have been pretty hard as well, but yeah. I feel like there's there's some big players and to get ahead, you know, to get a gun now, you're competing with some big dogs that have got a lot of players on the list. I know when I was going through the process, no matter the pitch, it was just like who's in your stable was probably one of the main things and they'd show you the list. So coming through the ranks now would be very difficult um, unless, Mel, you come back, you got all the contacts, <laughs> I'm sure the relationship thing would work. But talk to me about how it all started. Like w w how do you, how did you become a part of the furniture at Connor Sports Management? Like your, your family there and um, you were there for 11 years? Yeah, 11 and a half years, yeah. So where did it start? Like we're talking about, I'm talking like, you just finished school. Like how early was it? It was, it was like, it wasn't planned at all. It was kind of just by choice, like purely by luck. Um, I finished year 12 and I had a bit of a, like a turbulent year, like kind of year 12. Um, I was school captain at the time. Um, but at this, and as well as juggling that and exams, my dad was really sick and he was in hospital for about nine to 10 months of the year. So my cycle was, I would go to school till 11, uh, 3.15 and then I would go and sit in the hospital for five, six hours with my dad and then I would try and study when I got back and then go to school. And so it was a bit of, and not too many people knew about that. So it was, it was really difficult. So when I left school, didn't probably do as well as I wanted to and probably school didn't want me to either. Um, and then I was like, great, what did I want to do? I think I kind of wanted to be in PR, then I wanted to be in physio, but I kind of was like, I don't really know what I want to do, but I know I want to have a year off. Um, I remember in about year 10, they had a careers day and they took us to the Melbourne Exhibition Centre and I had this pamphlet for like AFL Sports Ready. I didn't know what AFL Sports Ready was, um, but I was a big Carlton fan, still am a big Carlton fan, go the Blues. Um, I didn't know so, Did you, you not know that? Nah, I just thought you'd go for everyone, but well, there you I, go. I mean, I was Carlton before I was at Carlton yeah, yeah, Sports yeah. and then obviously then I just became that nut job that went for both no, sides when they went to the game. always putting photos of a Charlie Kerr now. You just get, <laughs> I know you're good mates with him, but you're always getting around him and now I know why. Yeah. So basically, yeah. So I, I, I just went and applied on AFL Sports Ready and then- they kind of called me to come and do a couple of, you know, they do traineeships at like an events company or do you want to go work at a golf course or do you want to do all these sorts of things? And I got a call for Connor Sports Management. I had no idea what Connor Sports Management was. I don't know if Paul ever told you the story. but I've got a little bit of mayo. Okay. Mayo, sorry. <laughs> used to say mayo. But um, I don't know if you ever came to our old office on Hawthorne Road in East Brighton, but no, basically so. like the Connor Sports office was in like the, this like this back office, but in the front of the office was this like wine distributing company. So anyway, I've like walked in and I've like gone to the reception lady and I was like, oh, hi, I'm here for an interview. And she was a bit frazzled and she was like, oh, it's weird. Okay. um, Yeah. Okay. No worries. They said so they like kind of like, it, like took me into this side room and then started asking me questions about like wine distributing. And I was like, am I in the wrong place? Oh wow! And then like five minutes in, I was like, you're not, this isn't kind of sports, is it? And they were like, oh no, you're, you're down the back. So I basically did a whole other interview about something else before I went and met Paul. How's the improv on them, by I know, the way? Like, I know, yeah, they were just on the fly. <laughs> Probably could have got two jobs that day. No. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I went into an interview with Paul and I was a girl called Tessa Burton at the time as well. who was another AFL sports ready, um, person and they it was we had this boardroom and you know what Paul's like comes and sits on the side puts his feet up on the table and I was like what is going on <laughs> and he was like he was like I just remember one of the like most random questions because he because he's like oh who do you go for and I said oh, I'm Carlton he goes right so what are you going to do if Brendan Favola rings you on the weekend and asks you to transfer me money or something like that and I was like I don't know he's just a normal person answer the phone do your job and kind of go with it and he's like Great answer. Yeah, yeah, good answer. Um, and then I don't remember really much after what else he asked me, but then I remember leaving leaving Connor Sports, driving down the road, and Paul called me like five minutes after I left and said, do you want to start in January? Um, so I started with Connor Sports the year after. Um, Paul, I think Paul said this in his podcast as well with you, but he basically gave me an absolute lashing after three months because 
I wasn't doing any work. I didn't know what I was doing. And like, to be fair, I was like, I was 18. And I, I actually remember the job that he was really annoyed at me about was he went to Perth for like a week and he's like, I need you to sort out all the share trading statements and put them in the 6L. And then it like spits it out and tells you where your net profit position is. I'm 18. I've got no idea what this <laughs> stuff is. So I was just kind of like twiddling my thumbs for a bit. And then he kind of gave me a spray and said, you know, if I, if I didn't have to pay you, I wouldn't blah, blah, blah. And then I think that was my turning point, actually, in the moment where I was like, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. Yeah, you need a little bit of fight, yeah. a little bit of a challenge. Yeah. It's good leadership from Love the big you, dog. Paul. Thanks for thanks for that. Um, big but dog's yeah. giving you a little bit of fight. Yeah. Um, so then, yeah, so then, I mean, obviously then I was there for a good 10 years after, but um, after my sports ready traineeship was over, um, I applied to go to Deakin University and study Bachelor of Commerce, majored in sports management and marketing. So I did that full-time whilst I also worked four days a week at Connor Sports. Um, and then after the three years, Paul employed me full-time. And then I did my agent's accreditation, I think, a year later. And I, at the time, I was one of five player agents, I think, of out of 90 in the country. I don't know how many female agents there are, hopefully a lot more now. Um, but I, I'm a big believer of uh, – Lucy was one of my, um, I, could, I guess, kind of idols. And there's um, Farrah Luff, who also works at uh, Clutch Sports, who's another one of mine. But – Females, you know, female agents, sports agents, I think is a really tough job. And I think it's really important. You need to see it to believe it. And Lucy for, was that for me. Um, and I wanted to be able to show other girls in the industry that you could do this job as well. So that's why I went and did it. Lucy must have been a great mentor. I just missed her. I know Gary Gibbonson would talk highly of her. Yeah. I think she was there just before. I, I think she left after I arrived. Yeah. Um, was she someone that you'd speak to? Well, obviously, Paul would have mentored you, but was she someone that you really went to a lot? Yeah, Luce and I were in the office a lot together during during my time. It was mainly it was just mainly us a lot of like a lot. So I would sit next to her. I would listen to how she would conduct herself with her clients and and how she would speak to people. And I think I learned a lot just from being you know passively just from being next to her. And obviously she went on and did great things. And she started the Lighthouse and looks after Rebecca Jard and Adam Goods. Um, so she's done really well. So yeah, definitely learned a lot from her. But I also I think her and Paul were the perfect pair to learn from each other. And I always say like, we all complemented each other really well because each other's strengths was the other person's weakness and mm. vice versa. So it was like a perfect yin and yang. And we, yeah, we were a really good team and I had a lot of fun learning from them. You always said, let's give Paul a polish while we're on the great man. You always <laughs> said uh, that he, there's just no one better than him in a negotiation. We never get to see it because He's yeah. like, how you going, brother? You know, here's a checkbook, sign this. He's fiddling around with I his pen. Checkbooks. You know, yeah, he's they, like, here you apparently go. Apparently, they're but. still around, Tommy. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean. I'd see the great man. He's, I'm like, signing the checkbooks. Like, yeah. okay, now we're still in 2002, are we? But anyway, I used to love catching up with Paul. He'd always take us out for lunch and you'd be there. And we used, we used to always love it. I my company credit card yeah, more than any. Yeah, company credit card. Yeah, it's just like, whatever. You know, he, I must say, he's always, I, I think I told him on our podcast, he'd go, brother, we're just down here in Subiaco at Dome. I'm like, oh, oh get dumb. No one, <laughs> no, no mate, one wanted to go to Dome. Car, that credit card, that Dome, that's twelve dollars a meal. I'm, I get down to free. I want to spend fifty. Dome. We were, I mean, we were always trying to go, go a bit, you know, left, right, field, get out of there. But he was, he was just very happy to sit at Dome, and you know, love Dome and uh, Subi as well. Like other end for us. I'm like, yeah. come on, mate, yeah, Dome. Right. We're better than that. And yeah. I think we, it took me seven years to give him the feedback about Dome. It took you seven years. <laughs> oh, well, when you're a young player, you can't be yeah, telling true. him where to eat. I think eat. it was less than seven years to be fair. Mayonnaise on that one, bit of sriracha. But um, some funny things about Paul that you you know some some cool moments that you just just little as you said he's got the feet up on the table. Um, what are some cool things about Paul that you just remember? He has the most unhealthy obsession with Red Bull, like sugar free <laughs> Red Bull, mind you. I mean, the smell in his Toyota Kluger like used to just overpower you, and you'd have to like. Sometimes, like, I, I get, like, really car sick. So sometimes if we've been in the car for a long time, you could, all you could smell was sugar-free Red Bull. I'd be like, I've got to put the window down. But he'd <laughs> it was like you put it down and then he would put it automatically back up. <laughs> He's like, no, 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 Mel, we don't we don't put down the windows on the freeway. <laughs> I'm like, oh, my God, dying. Um, loved a tan. Yep. Like, I think... I don't think there's too many people that can say that they've seen their boss with their top off that many times. Yeah, loves it. Any opportunity to get a tan on, he was on. I think Juddy used to tell this great story of um, when he was at West Coast and Paul would be topless on the hill training and he, like they'd be like, isn't that your manager? And they'd be like, yeah. And he was just there, <laughs> raring to go, probably talking to Nizzy down there with his top off. Um, 
But you go back to negotiating. I think, you know, Paul's got his quirks. We love him for it. Um, but he, oh, actually, before I forget, can we also go about how we can't stop, ne- like, doodling on yeah. napkins? Fiddling, it's great. Oh, the, the napkins, the zeros. I think... I think I watched him do Toby one of Toby Green's deals on a napkin with Gubby Allen at the draft one year, like pure like wet napkin, but also just couldn't sit still. Always got to play with the sugar shakers. Yeah, yeah. Brain's always racing. Always racing. Always racing. But yeah, in terms of the best negotiator, like not to not to pump you up too much, Paul Connors, but um, yeah, he was one. Like he's definitely the best. Like I think the year where there was the CBA was a bit all over the shop, and there was TPP clauses that you know that were people were putting into contracts because we didn't know where the CBA was going. I remember the AFL did this like this kind of presentation of how many players had them and who had who didn't and they were all Paul's all Paul's clients. So I think, you know, he's one of the most knowledgeable, if not the most knowledgeable in the industry and he is the best to get your footy contract done. Yeah, that's great. We love that. I'll never forget Paul. Thanks, Paul. I'll take 10% from that. <laughs> <laughs> he put TPP in mind. Yeah. What's TPP stand for, for everyone listening? Total play of payments. And that was like, just so everyone knows. It's that like was- the your, your club salary cap. So basically if what it was is if the salary cap went up, the player's salary would go up with the salary cap. So there was obviously more money to play with, therefore the players should be more rewarded with that yeah, money. Yeah, and generally it always goes up. So it was a, it was a nice little juicy money for him. Yeah, it was. Um, especially when you're a, you know, you're a fringe player like me, just any, anything on top for the off-season so you can just go oh, blow it. Off-season. Got some stories about you in the off-season, <laughs> talk, mate. You, got, you can tell the stories in a second. Let's talk about a few players that you've you've managed from when you started to now. There's, a, I know I like to name drop a little bit, but there's some big time players and you've dealt with the highs and lows of mm-hmm. footballers. Any that, any that come to mind that, you know, maybe your first break or, you know, the first contract that you're, you know, you're around that you're just like, wow, this, this is just so cool. I feel you know alive in this role. Yeah. I mean, we, we all kind of had different roles to play right at Connor Sports. Paul was always the person that did your footy contract. And then I always used to say, did everything else kind of from the marketing side of things, the welfare side of things. And Paul and I would work on the financial tax side of things together. Um, I think for me, when I became accredited and I did my first contract um, with Adelaide, Josh Jenkins, David Noble and Paul, it was probably, you know, it was one of those moments where a player trusts you completely and doesn't doesn't use your your gender or your background or the fact that you've never played football as something against you like Josh just trusted me wholeheartedly and I think that's one of those one of those moments in life where you, where you go this is what I've been working to for for a long time and I was really appreciative of that um you know when when the when your foot when sorry when your client goes and holds up the premiership cup or wins a brown low you're always proud to be there for, like to see them achieve their goals and their dreams so obviously very lucky to have managed and be a part of Luke Hodge's career in life and was one of my closest clients I think during that time Hodge and I used to live down the road from each other so on like pretty much I was at his house two three times a week we would sit and have dinner with him and his kids and Laura and his wife and you know we're still really close to this day but um I think for me it's not so much milestones in players careers it's just seeing you guys achieve your dreams and get you know from the moment you're drafted and then also it's always sad when people retire, but amazing things that people do when they leave footy as well. So there's no like one real like mm. pinpoint moment. I think you always kind of remember, I mean, who I think I've remember more ACLs than I remember anything else sometimes. Um, and sometimes the the bad kind of outweighs the positive kind of memories a little bit. Cause there's, I mean, when you've got 70 clients to a hundred clients, I think of it was, there was a lot going on and I think footy went through a really turbulent time with gambling and drugs um, in the last five years that I was around. So that kind of really weighed me down. And as you know me, I like to make sure that everybody is got a voice and got a, someone to listen to and to be there. And it kind of probably ate me up a little bit as well. But, um, you know, definitely back to the positives, draft, draft day, premiership, finals, you know, any kind of milestone. I just loved, loved being on the journey with you all. You're spot on. It's like, there's a lot of highs, but geez, there's a lot of lows and the lows are generally all covered up and you don't see them. You don't yeah. hear about them. It's all confidential. That's kind of your role. That's why everyone loves you. And, and you, you know, you, you, you went over and beyond. I've got some stuff I'll read out later. Um, is that hard? Like you, do you, do you have to then go, you know, we all go see psychologists on the side and we, we recommend that everyone should go get the old tune up as they say. Um, you go to a physio for your body, you go to a, you know, a psychologist for your brain. 
you are so caring and you go, you know, over and beyond for all your clients. I guess they're not even clients to you. They're friends. That's how, you know, I'd say we're more friends and that's why everyone trusts you. But your phone's always on. Mm -hmm. So it would have been so hard to switch off because at any moment you get that call. Perth's obviously 15 hours behind, it feels like, (laughs) now that I'm in Melbourne. But Perth is two hours, three hours, depending on daylight savings behind. You know, you're you're always on and there's always, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. You wake up, bang, Mel, I need you. Mm. I'd imagine you would have had a lot of those calls. Not that you're going to get into the detail, but do they weigh you down after, you know, after they keep stacking up? Yeah, definitely. I mean, your job, your job as an agent is to always be on and to be there for your, for your client, no matter what happens. And I think early days for me, I mean, I'm an adrenaline junkie in terms of work. So I, I love the go, go, go and the constant like on the go. And, um, but yeah, I think towards the end, it was, it, for me, it was a bit too much. I'd, I'd done it for over 10 years and I, you know, I was seeing thing, not seeing things, but it was, you know, it was more, it was starting to weigh me down and it is really hard because you can't switch off. Like, you know, I think I started seeing, um, I started seeing a psychologist probably, in my last five years of Connor Sports. And, you know, even like being that one hour a week that would zone me out, the anxiety of picking up my phone to see what was after, like, you know, had gone on the after through that hour, I was like, oh my God. And it was, you know, it was, it's a lot. And you have to be really resilient in this job because, you know, it's not just signing a football contract every couple of years and doing a deal. It's, it's so much more than that. An agent is, you are, I always say like being a player agent is going to set me up for motherhood because it taught me how to mother 18 to 30 year old (laughs) men (laughs) Um, and all the different personalities and the things that life throws at you. Like, you know, you're 18 years old coming into a game earning, you know, 200 to $250,000 a year. And all your mates are at, not at uni or not at uni and they're all partying and getting into the wrong things that you, you shouldn't be g- getting into. And what you guys are trying to focus on is just getting yourself on the park and getting games on. Um, so trying to balance that and educate young boys from a really young age to make sure that they're set up for life is, is a difficult challenge. But I loved it. Um, and I don't regret the time that I had in the job. Definitely not. It's taught me a lot of life lessons and made me who I am today. But yeah, you do have to like mindfulness in this sport and in sport in general in life is super important. And I kind of wish I did it earlier. Maybe it would have kept me around longer. Yeah. Um, but no, it was, it does weigh you down. And, you know, you, I mean, I think the only time I ever told the boys that my phone was off was when Game of Thrones was on. And it was like Monday night, it was like 8.30 to 9.30. I was like, don't contact me for an hour. I'm, I'm, I'm zoned into Game of Thrones. You still would have got um, some contacts, I reckon. Yeah, but, but like, but even like, you know, people think, oh, off season, right? Like it's quiet. The boys are gone overseas. No. Yeah, well, we've got some stories. Yeah, and we know, you know, big shout out to TFG, our man, Toby Green. He's got some stories. I want you to give one more insight to being a player agent. Mm-hmm. A week, right? Don't tell me the players, but just what goes on. Like, just give everyone an insight to why it's so stressful. We're talking about the highs, the lows, the things that you're doing. You know what I mean? Like from a Monday to, to Sunday, you know, like just the things that go on in your life when you are full-time player agent. What I loved about the job was that every day was different. So like, it wasn't like every day you come, you sit in the office and you do the same things. Like every day, no matter what, was going to be different. And because we had such a such a colourful list, you always had, you know, different things kind of thrown in you. So during the, like, probably start of the week, you'd figure out who was in town, so who was playing. So, you know, for example, the Giants are in town this weekend. So it's like, you know, work out when they land, what night have they got off? You go sit, like, I mean, the guys at the Pullman in Albert Park knew me, would come and give me coffees because I was always sitting there, you know, from a Thursday to a Sunday to seeing whoever was in town. So you'd work out who was in town um, for that weekend because everyone obviously thinks Monday to Friday is your day job, but then really Friday to Sunday is when you need to be there and, and checking with the boys as well because they're playing. Um, so Monday to Friday could be anything. It's budgets, making sure like, you know, you're getting out player budgets, under making sure you guys understand what money you've spent for the month, which I know you loved me doing. Mm. Um, it would be ordering football boots for the weekend or who, who had boot orders coming in. It'd be ad hoc player appearances. It'd be sponsorship agreements, things that were in renewal or something, new sponsor coming through and negotiating, negotiating that. It might be at the time there was a lot of footy shows, obviously. So Media. it was like the footy show. Um, it was before the game. There's all these types of channel seven, channel nine, channel 10. So you'd be every week trying to get a slot for one of your players who was in town to make sure those who wanted to be out in the media and have a bit of a PR presence, you were kind of fulfilling that role for them. And obviously you have to work with the footy clubs to make sure that that was approved. And, you know, if someone, if the player had lost or something significant had happened in the club that that player had been briefed. So you'd go through that cycle with them. 
And then I'm trying to think what out else. Out of contract, was. you'd be doing contract yeah, out talks. out of contract. You know, like Paul would really lead those conversations. But then, you know, if a player was in town, it'd be like your one opportunity to like kind of be like, bang, sign your checkbook. We need you to, to set up some direct debits or, you know, this bill's come through. You're happy for this to be paid. Or it was, you know, there was a, a lot. I mean, you know, like it's a lot of, it's a very ha- admin heavy job um, and trying to make sure that everybody was on, always had everything that they needed was kind of like every week basically. And the touch points to have you face to face was really invaluable. Um, so yeah, but then, you know, it's, it's so many, so much other things, right? Thursday night or Wednesday, Thursday night was the time that you'd have to be on your phone because players get dropped. Yeah. And they, they're the hardest conversations, right? Because a lot of them the same coach is not communicating with me. I haven't been dropped this, or I've got injured or something like that. So, you know, Wednesday to Thursday night, we'll be having this cycle of having a conversation with your players who had been dropped for that round, trying to, trying to pick people up, make sure that they're okay, make sure they can go and play in the twos and have a good round and not focus on that. So it's, you know, when the, when the five o'clock kind of shut off goes, that's your time. That's the welfare time. Cause the boys are driving back from training. Anything could be coming up. It could. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a, it's crazy. It's really. crazy. There's a lot of stuff that's going on, you know, or you, also you're not having only just contact with you guys, but you know, from, you have parents as well who contact you. So you're, Big Briz, always uh, sometimes when uh, I need to pull you into line and call your dad on the odd occasion. Once or twice. Once the Briz wasn't like that. When I'm in Vegas and I get back, yeah, maybe. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, you're dealing, you're not just dealing with a player, you're but dealing a lot with of parents. parents. Like, parents, but, partners, girlfriends, wives, you know, there's, there's a lot stop. of- It doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. And just to give people insight, I, I'm hara- I, looking back now, you ba- like you were too good to me. Like you were, <laughs> you, you were that good. And what, what are you going to do when you do something, you know, I've got a parking fine. Can you help me out? Yeah, yeah, we'll pay it. You know what I mean? And, we, and then, oh, Mel's paying me parking fines. Okay, so I've got another fine email. And then you guys would do it because, which looking back now, I, I should have done it, but that's just how good the service was. You know, you think about it now that you're mature and you've grown up and you think, oh, Connor Sports did everything for me. So it actually become a bit harder when you come out of it because you don't need, you don't have a manager anymore. So, you know, you're living your life um, and you're, you're doing things that you probably should have done earlier, but yeah. it's all good. It's all learning. But you guys did so much for players uh, and you, and they still do, but you in particular, and I know Georgie was, um, you know, we'd kind of speak to you as probably way more than Paul, unless we're out of contract. Like you said, Paul was the king for contracts and the news were welfare um, and admin and life. And just, if you got, you know, you got dropped, you'd be, you'd need to have a little bit of a vent or something, yeah. which is every second week for the big fella. <laughs> <laughs> and, you, and, this, and mind you, there's what, a hundred on your, on your books. Mm. I don't, you know, it, it's crazy. It is crazy. Yeah. Do you feel like it's um you almost needed a break as well? Like after yeah, you're done? I think you definitely, like I definitely, the thing is like now I can kind of go away and have a bit of love for the game again and, and, and not be bogged down in, Gambling in itself was quite a, I think at the time, maybe when I left was a lot of players were kind of involved in it. Um, and it's, it does suck you up because, you know, I think for me, like I always, it was always would make the problem, my problem to make sure it was like a problem halved. So I would take on that load and that emotional support for the player. Um, and I, I think, you know, the, one of the nicest things I think Paul and I did when I left was we sat down and went through the list and went through everyone's kind of financial position. Um, and it was really nice that, you know, majority of the people that I ran it were lucky to manage was were in a really good position. And I actually do remember, and hopefully he doesn't mind me saying this, but um, Watsy and I used to have some tiffs about money back in the heyday, as I think I did with you. And I remember he said to me, you remember that time when you told me that there would be a rainy day that would come? He's like, the rainy day came and thank you so much for for that and that was you know that was during COVID when people weren't working and getting money and things like that. It, it, it gambling and spending money is just such a, it's just it's just a habit you have growing yeah. up. But when you're getting you're getting paid so well when you're 18 and you know onwards, you don't really respect. Like now that I'm out of the game. Far out. Like you yeah. just think like, man, I was blowing cash on clothes. You go to the track, you wouldn't care. You go drink and who wants a drink? You know, maybe yeah. you still do that every now and then. Yeah. But it's just you've got way more appreciation for money and it's so and hard. saving yeah. in the because it's yeah it's so hard but you don't but you guys like didn't so it's it's not just you guys it's it's I think it's but AFL in general like you don't appreciate the money you earn until you don't have it yeah and I think that was one of the biggest things that we always tried to do at Connors was to in your first you know from the your first year to the fourth year your job is to get on the park and play a game we will set up everything financially for you and bring you along the journey. 
make sure that you save money so you can buy a house, like you go and invest and whatever. But you do what you do, what you're good at, which is get on the field and we'll do what we're good at is setting you up for life after footy. And then when the player is ready, bring them in so that when they leave footy that they can take all this stuff on. Now, I appreciate that that doesn't always happen because nobody wants the ride to end. And it's always, you know, you don't want to know that you can't buy a Rolex or you can't buy a car. You guys loved cars for, you know. I didn't. Go, Johnny the Jeep. J- Johnny the Grand. Jeep. Johnny the Jeep was Ten all right. Years. But, you know, some, some of you did. Some, and American stories. Yeah. You, you were off-season trips, let's be real. <laughs> um, but, you know, those things, like, you know, you didn't want that. Like, people don't want those those luxuries in life to yeah. end, but eventually they kind of do. And some some players learn the hard way and some players get on board and, and do that before the end. Um, so it's, you know, but I love that. I love that part of it was, you know, educating, being part of it, you know, figuring out all the different ways of, you know, how you're going to pay off your house. I know it sounds really boring, but how do you pay off your house? Or how can you make sure that after you leave footy, you don't have to worry about, you don't have to worry, like no one's going to pay you 250, 300, $800,000 a year again. So, you know, learning to live off a, an average you know, the Australian average salary, yeah. but still keep your house and all the lovely things that you've bought along the way. That's what people probably don't understand um, is, the, the, oh, mate, you got heaps of money, you know, but then Connor's management have you on a and a strict budget, especially when you're younger, you know, strict you let them budgets, go. But, yeah. Uh, I remember I remember a pretty funny story when I was 18. They didn't have Sunday. On the weekend, ComBank, you couldn't trade money. Yeah, yeah. So, it would take 24 hours for the money to get from our bank account yeah. to your bank account. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, geez, it was tough times there on a Friday if, you know, you did spend a bit of money and then all of a sudden, sun, yeah, sun, but, Sunday, you're on the phone and Mel going, I've got no cash. I think, 18-year-old. Then like, you, then you money, but I can't access it. You've got access to That's it. That's why you took my credit card to <laughs> Vegas, right? We did do that before. I, I remember getting a booth and I did, couldn't, I never had, I never, like, I don't, I don't hold a credit card. Um, All money's tied up. But I remember one day, yeah, I just sent you the message, was, like, we're going to need that credit card, Mel, and you can take it out in a row. <laughs> Me, I reckon. I think that I you think can take I wo- it out of my other account. I think that you've got I woke the up the to. next day and I went to check. I went to pay something on my company credit card, and it was like I had this message. It was like, oh, it's been bl- it's been blocked, and I was like, it's a bit weird. And then I like logged on, and I was like, oh my god, Tommy's, <laughs> Tommy's maxed out. It was like what is some LA bar or some some hotel you were at. Yeah, it was a ta- then, it was a table in LA. And then I clipped you. And then what did you do? The next night, you did the same thing yeah, again. It was, it was all it was on. It was on for young and old there. First oh, night gosh. fever. Yeah, but that was just give. Her, I got consent to do that obviously you said if you need to go <laughs> over the budget you can use the credit card use the details it's got a max limit of whatever yeah um yeah that wasn't good when i got home I remember you guys sat me down I and think, this is good insight for people out I there think, so it was, i, I was looking, came in yeah the old boy might have called and said <laughs> i need to have a chat so and that's when i remember sat down with all of you and you said look at what you've spent and i looked at it and obviously the currency in us it, it didn't look as bad at the time you get back converted to you know AUD. aussie it's and you're scary. Like, you could have bought a house with that and it's like, oh Jesus Christ. Yeah. But that's what you do when you're young and I don't regret it. It, it makes you um it definitely I mean maybe you do regret it a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> now that Just you're out of the game, bit. geez, I could do with a bit of that. But uh no, that's great times and great memories and um some great stories. But yeah, I think you'd how many times you, would you see something similar, like a similar pattern, wouldn't you? Oh my God, like too often. Like it's like I've already had this chat with this guy and this guy, but anyway, I'll tell but you what you know again. What, the, what, what I realized I think in the end is like no matter how much I like kind of beat the drum of like we need to do this and this and this, you guys all come to that realization yourselves at the end of it. Um, some people don't on the odd occasion, but mm. majority do. But, you know, no one reg- you don't, don't regret your life decisions. You made them for a reason. They make you who you are today. Do you have some really strong re- rewarding moments that just stick out? Like where you just go, oh, that was really like I love that moment or – uh, when I was at Connors? Yeah, when you're at Connors. Um, you touched on grand finals, brown lows. Were there any in particular where you, you know, you talked about like, you know, I know you looked after Johnny Patton. He had three knees. You would have looked after plenty of other people like Watsy who went through, you know, we spoke about it on our pod. He just didn't enjoy footy in the end. Number one yeah. pick, too much media, just didn't want it. Such a nice guy, like just gets bashed up by the media. But like you're dealing with all these people on the side no one would know about. Mm. Um, but then to see them come through and shine on certain days, are there any moments that stand out? Or well, there's yeah. probably thousands. But- yeah, I think like, I always go for the, like, you know, you always go for the underdog. So I think, you know, poor Johnny and and Nick Nat, like went through a series of ACLs and, you know, people don't see how, how bad those like first 48 hours are with a player. Um, I think, 
Johnny, Dale Thomas and a couple of others probably were the lucky recipients of my mum's homemade cooking um, <laughs> when they had their knees. Um, so, you know, you'd go and sit with, you go and sit with players when, when they're in their darkest times and they know that they're out for 12 months. Or I think, you know, some of the, I think probably like the most rewarding kind of like the moments where you get really emotional. One of the times was um, after the Essendon ban happened mm. and the year the year after all the boys were allowed to play again, Michael Hibbard, Michael Hurley and Patrick Ryder all made the All-Australian team. And they, I said to them all, like, it was like, you know, that 12 months, even before that was some of the most emotional times I think no one will ever really understand. And I know people will have their own opinion of what happened and, and whatnot, but the our Essendon boys are some of the most incredible human beings, most resilient people I have ever met. And to see the three of them standing there with their jackets, I was a blubbering mess. Like, <laughs> And, you know, they got together and they took this photo and they were like, you know, Mel, we're here. And, you know, that was, I think for me, one of the most amazing moments of being like, you know, they've gone through the shit, you know, they, they could, you know, people like Stuart Cramery missed a premiership at the Bulldogs. Like, you know, there's all these moments, but then you see them come back, get on the park, get on with it. And it's, you know, become all Australian, like the next year is just incredible. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one that kind of like sticks out, you know, whenever the player comes back from a big injury and they've had a good game or, you know, I don't know, Watsy comes in and kicks, a, kicks an absolute kicks a, belter yeah, goal yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the MCG and the whole, you know, the whole crowd erupts like, yeah, you know, like I'm, I'm, I'm really lucky. Like our clients were the, some of the best people I think I've ever worked with and still some of my great mates, but you just want everyone to do really well. So, you know, when they've all come and had a really tough time and had a moment that kind of brings them back, like that's the moments that you go, yeah, bang, go. Yeah. That's awesome. It's uh, the, the Essen ones, you know, those three, Three men are in, in, you know, really impressive individuals, but yeah, you forget about that, don't you? Like everyone's moved on and had enough, but you can only imagine the toll that took on them. And then to bounce back a year later, I can only imagine the amount of phone calls you would have had um, with those players. Now I've spoken to a couple of players. Um, oh, as we know, this was quick <laughs> turnarounds. When you come yeah. back next time, I can put up a story and all the aces get a chance, but this is just a little bit of insight and, and, and don't get emotional on me. Just, just going <laughs> to. Just going to read out why people loved you and the insights. And you know how much I love you and, 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 uh, you know, you looked after me, but we're just friends. We're not, you didn't manage me. We're just very close friends. This is insight. So Toby Green, the great man's given me permission to say this, but he'll never forget about the level of care you had for him and, and, and all your players. You'd always go over and, and beyond. Um, he'll never forget the time you picked him up from the airport after he texted you from some, uh, with some serious concern, boarding his flight home from Thailand. He said, there is something seriously wrong with my leg, Mel. Um, and he reckons you weren't even at the airport, you're at home and he's running out of reception. So you, he reckons by the time he landed, you're at the airport waiting for him whilst he had no service on the plane and you rushed him to hospital where you then found he had a serious infection in his leg. It was actually his birthday that day. Um, and he'll never forget it. He reckons you calmed him down, you took him to hospital, uh, and then you drove him to his family and friends event that night for his birthday. So these are little insights that I'm sure bring back some memories. But uh, Moral of the story, don't get a henna tattoo in Thailand. <laughs> Toby would have gave you a few scares, wouldn't he, back in the day? I yeah. mean, he's one of your favourites. I know that. And we lived together and it's um, it was a blessing that we both were managed by you. There's always plenty of phone calls. But Again, another one there, like the key words there from Tobes is like, you'd go over and beyond and you had so much care, like a ridiculous level amount. Um, any, uh, any, any fond memories with Toby outside of that one? I always say Toby's like the little brother I never had. And you know what? Someone actually texted me, which was actually quite nice. I was, I woke up one morning in the UK a couple of weeks ago and they were like, are you happy about Toby? And I was like, what are they talking about? It was the news that Toby was the captain of the Giants. And you're like, in those moments, you know, Toby's, Toby's gone through a bit of a roller coaster in his career, a amazing footballer, but would never hurt a fly. And I think like those, like seeing him like now become the captain and, you know, take on this role, it's like, you know, proud, like proud mama, big sister moment. And we always say that, um, you always say like, we're kind of like the sibling, we're, we've been siblings to each other this whole time. So yeah. Tobes is special. Always will be Prince of Ashy. Yeah, Ashburton. Yeah. Kings and Queens. I mean, we're sitting in the lovely suburbs of Ashburton right now. We are. The Roller Media van at the front. You're all, I think <laughs> I think your mum's at the front with the paparazzi. She <laughs> can't get the camera away. She's, got the, uh, She's a bit excited. Kodak She's a bit excited, moments. mum. Oh, that's fantastic. Um, 
Oh, I'm on. Uh, there's another player here that I've reached out. Obviously, the rat, Rory Atkins. Uh, he, he, similar vibes here. I just know she generally cared for me and everything I had going on and always had been a great supporter of me, gave me as much time when I looked like a 20-year-old rat <laughs> going on to be a 26-year-old 100-game <laughs> player, an unwavering amount of care and support for someone and someone you always want in your corner, especially on a night out. <laughs> 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 Work hard, play hard. I love that. And we used to love the company card, the didn't company we? The company card, it was just so easy. You know, you guys had played for the weekend. We'd go out, we'd have a nice dinner, and then, you know, we'd just have a you know, couple of cocktails. A couple of drinks. Couple and of it's drinks. probably our fault. So if Paul ever got the statements, you could I think, just blame I it think on us. I think Cam Rayner did, it, did one for me, like like after the season once, we went up to Queensland. We always used to try and come and see you guys at the end of the season. And Cam... Cam took my card and came back. He's like, I've bought 47 Frangelico shots. And I was like, oh, not sure that's a tax deduction, but yeah, cool. <laughs> and what? You, and that's the thing. You could always just go to Paul and say, well, it was Cam. Yeah. And by the way, Cam, on fire lately. On fire. Go Cam. Go Lions. All right. From Paul Connors, the great man, Mally. Oh, wow. Mally has the most amaz- amazing emotional intelligence. Loved her ability and desire to get to know the person, not just the sportsman. In this case, footballer. She built long-lasting relationships that seamlessly became long, sorry, seamlessly became lifelong friendships. He has an early memory of you. He said an early memory was when Mel started working with us straight after school through the AFL traineeship <laughs> program, which you touched on earlier with Sports Ready. And to be fair, there wasn't a lot to do, but I think <laughs> it's also fair to say we both weren't sure it would turn out the way it did with Mel conquering the world and now working in one of her loves being in F1. Oh, uh, very nice from the great man. Uh, that, that, again, touching on your story as well. He didn't put in the uh, spreadsheet when he gave you the- He probably doesn't <laughs> remember what it was. ANZ margin lending that was that was that was the one of the worst jobs i reckon i had to do oh uh, some really nice little uh, messages there from some people that looked after you and obviously some close friends of mine now mel you know how much i love you um you don't come on this <laughs> podcast all the way from london and you don't go home with anything now obviously this is you're our first female guest i think <laughs> like so you know our sponsors we're all oh about men's God. grooming <laughs> products i've got milwaukee Jeez, tools can't wait to get my beard <laughs> trimmer out so, like, i'm not gonna ask you what you're doing down there like as we do with the boys so stay away from that one but what i will ask you is you've managed a lot of people so on behalf of beard and blade and we love beard and blade i've got the hero beard trimmer here the heavy duty beard trimmer as i said it's not just for the beard it's for down there as well um and it's for everywhere but that is for you and the reason is for you because i wanted to i want you to you know maybe align it to someone that you've managed who's someone that you managed at connor's sports back in the day that you think could do with one of these oh gosh Oof. we'll put you under the pump here you put me under the pump let's reverse engineer the question while you think of that one who's the most well-groomed connor sports player that you reckon is always looking sharp, million bucks, can't go, you know, game day without looking fresh, trim, beard, do clean. Know, I, I, do you know what? He's going to hate me for saying this probably. Josh Jenkins, I knew the day before a game, he'd go and have a hairy and he would go and shave his legs oh. and get ready to go. So he's probably the most well-groomed. There you go. And I'm probably, you know, in terms of if thinking about beards, Michael Hurley always had a very strong beard. Mm. Um, cut his hair off a couple of times for charity as well. So they're the two mm. that kind of stick out to mind. Love it. Who's the guy that's not well groomed? Who's someone? <laughs> I've got one in mind that I think comes to mind very well. I mean, he kind of has a go. And it's not. This is a, this is just this isn't a whack. It's a bit of fun. Has a go. Who is it? <laughs> or even Connor Blakely. He's now he's now at the Suns. I know he's he, he's always had this rough beard and and something going on. Surely oh, Blakers like, might need a hero beard trimmer. He might need a hero. Trimmer. You know what? From from the Frio love, let's give it to Connor. I reckon Connor Blakely who's now uh, a rookie at the Suns, hopefully gets a game soon. Uh, he's always had a bit of rough stuff going around the face, don't you reckon? I just thought, I'm trying to think of Connor Sports management yeah, players. As well. You've given me nothing here. I'm, I'm naming them for you. Well, I just don't, I just did the things that I don't really think about. Well-groomed with Callan Ward. Callan Ward's always well-groomed, always looks sleek, good hair, always presented well. See, Toby, if I gave you a razor, we'd give it to Toby because he... Toby's got no hair though. Exactly, because he shaves every second day. He thinks it's sickening if anyone's got stuff on Are their you, face. Actually, here's a topic. Toby Green. 
Does he put lemon juice in his hair during the summer oh, to get a bit of blonde tips or is it real? <laughs> and he denies it he denies as well. It every year. I, I wish I caught him doing it. I don't even Georgia, think Georgia, if you're listening, let us know, yeah? <laughs> Georgia will confirm. I know for a fact that Toby Green, I don't even think it's lemon juice. I reckon he goes down the street He's and gets like the actual peroxide. tips or something in yeah, there. Yeah, always. And he gets the nice tan. He's someone that loves a tan, gets he the loved, budgies out. He loves a tan. Oh, God bless him. A great man. Well, well done. There you go. Everyone out there, Beard and Blade, check it out. Head on website now at beardandblade.com.au. Use our discount code ACES and you'll get 15% off um, and free express shipping. Love that from you, Mel. Right, we've got the Rixies here. I know All you love the Rixies. These are hot. Like, I'm not, like, I've never had are a these, pair. Are these your, are these your favourites So now? these sold out. I'm not lying. So these are the Soho Cherries. These sold out. Then we pre-ordered and they're nearly sold out again. So Do you remember I, 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 when we first went? For the, I know you like the, the big frames. When the first oh, meeting yeah. that we went to to talk about Ricks in Perth. Yeah. Do you remember that? Oh, not really. You probably laughed at me. Did you? What, what did I say to you? No, we went to your business meeting to talk about oh, numbers yeah, for Ricks. Oh, yeah, with Cohen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you just said, if you want to do it, do it. I feel like Paul Connors when he came in here and he wore the sunglasses. With the, <laughs> yeah, you look his head backwards. Yeah, I'm actually very happy with my selection. Are you happy? Yeah, 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 good. I know Love you like it. the big frames, but- the I, I am a Sadie girl. I normally am a Sadie girl, I but, I, but I do like these. The cherries are quite cool. They are. They actually look fantastic, Thanks. the Soho Thanks. cherries. And again, same thing, discount code ACES. Leave them on for me, Mel, while you answer this question. Okay. This is, uh, geez, the amount of times I say that. I should say that at the start. We love seeing you in the Ricks while you answer this question. Now, Ricks and retirement is the segment. When Ooh. you are cashed up, so you've this is the one thing you do have. Let's it, it, play it as you cool, but like yeah. fake money. But you might have a billion dollars in the bank, right? You're all, you're finished up. Ridiculous, right? No, leave I them on. See. Why do people pull them down on their face because like I that? I can see you. No, there. leave them on for the theater. Okay, <laughs> Rick's in retirement. Where is Mel Oberhofer? <laughs> Did I nail it? Oberhofer. Where is Mel Oberhofer going to retire in her Rick's and why? When it's all said and done. Ooh, that's a really good question. Oh, uh, we actually had, my friends and I had this conversation the other day. I, I reckon it could change. I could be anywhere. I could be, I could be back in the leafy suburbs of Ashburton. I could be in London. I kind of feel like I will be in like a Mexico or a Bali or a Thailand, somewhere warm near the beach. If, no, if, give me one. All of them are great. All of them are great. But okay. right now it's, it all ended today. Where would you retire? Remember, money's not an issue. No, money, no issue. Okay, where am I retiring to? I am going to go to Mexico. Wow. I've just been to Mexico. Whereabouts in Mexico? I've never been. Oh, haven't you? But the, it just looks really beautiful. Yeah. Beaches. I think I just need to retire near the beach. You need I'm, water. I, I miss, That's the one thing I miss about being in London is I miss the beach. So after I leave your good self here in the leafy suburbs of Ashburton, we're heading down to Blagari and Sorrento for the weekend, so... Yeah, yeah, definitely miss that in London. It's not the same. You got to drive about five and a half hours, I think, to get to the beach. Yeah, is it? It gets really cold. I mean, you're about to walk into your summer, but yeah. it, does it get like what's colder, London or Melbourne in winter? London for sure. London? It did snow like a couple of weeks ago, but then now it's like spring over there. It's a bit like Melbourne weather, like twenty, like four seasons in a in a day sort of thing. I'm taking these off now. By yeah, way. yeah, take them off. Um, Rick's your retirement. Thank you for that. So there you go. Yeah, you, you, Mexico to Mel. I reckon Mexico. Yeah, or maybe maybe. Maybe the Galapagos Like Islands. a Tulum, Cancun vibe or Mexico City? No, I probably like Tulum, but yeah. I think, you know, of, of the places I've probably been to, I might, that I've actually been to, maybe the Galapagos Islands. There you go. Very mm. good. Very good. Well, there you go again. Head online at ricksideway.com.au and use the discount code ACES for 20% off and free express shipping. If you want the Soho cherries, I'll give you the tip. Hurry up and get them because they're literally nearly sold out. Um, now, again, out. I, I, you're the first female guest. I'm very proud of myself. My mum's been getting into me. When are you going to get a female guest? I said, Mum, I'm trying. I tell you, I can't what? start till Mel's on. I told you you'd be the first, didn't I? I said <laughs> you you'd be the tell first. Tell me this. I'm very a, feel very honoured that we. I think we made this promise about two years ago. No. Yeah, I think I started this a year yeah. and a half ago. So yeah. a man of integrity and a man of me word. Always, always. <laughs> when I tell you I'm going to get a booth in LA, I'm going to get <laughs> <laughs> that. I don't need to worry about. <laughs> um, our friends at Milwaukee Tools, they are amazing support to the podcast, and we generally ask a question here um of surrounding the tool the locker room or whatnot but for you i think it's going to be the handiest thing you've done in your career um the milwaukee tool 
handiest thing you've done in your career? So when you were starting out, we just spoke about a few breakthroughs, but what is one of those things that you look back now, you've already given, you know, you've given great advice around having coffees face to face, meeting people, you never know where it's going to go, but your Milwaukee tool handiest moment where you look back and go, I'm so grateful that I did that because that led to this. I don't think it's been one thing. I think it's something that Paul and I often spoke about um, when I was with at Connors, but I remember early days being like, you know, there's always a kind of element where somebody wants to, you know, if you're a, if you're a Brownlow medalist or you're a first round draft pick, I always believed that everybody should be treated the same and have the same level of service. And I would like to probably think that that kind of came across in my management style. And I think having treating everybody exactly the same is the reason why I had the relationships that I did. And, and it's also is the reason where I am today as well. Um, you, as Paul, Paul probably always said it, like you never know, you should always treat the CEO and the boot starter exactly the same because you don't know where the next person's going to be. And I do really firmly believe that. And I think that's what's just kind of held me in good stead and, and yeah, been able to meet the people that I've been able to meet along the way. So I don't think it's one moment. I think it's, yeah, just the general, the general kind of rule. For, um, it's for a me. great rule. It's a great rule. You've just reminded me of a very funny story. I remember being in the, uh, <laughs> well, the, the coach, you know who I used to have, but it was, I think he accidentally slipped up, but he, he goes, similar vibes to what you just said. And he goes, boys, this rule stands for everyone. It doesn't matter if you're the best player on our list, Matty Pavlich, or you're Hayden Sloyth on a rookie list. And we all just walked out the, le- the meeting room and went, oh, Sloyth, you've been done dirty there, son. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think he was trying to say yeah. like that, that, like exactly like that. Yeah. He was trying to sim- you know, say that we all treat each other equal, uh, no matter what you're getting paid and whatnot. But yeah. very funny and great advice, Mel. Um, and that's how you have lived. I mean, I can speak on behalf of myself. You know, I only played 80, but you've treated me like I was a Brownlow medalist five-timer. Um, <laughs> the, amount of, the amount of calls we had and the amount of time we spent together. You so a Brownlow medalist in my eyes. Yeah, I know, I know. It's all about relationships. You know that. Well, there you go, Milwaukee Tool. You're going to go home with the M18 Fuel Driven to Outperform Fuel Hatchet and the Battery Starter Pack. That's coming your way, Mel. How do you go on the tools? Are you, are you handy? I am rubbish, but um, <laughs> my my flatmate who you met, um, who's visiting with me at the moment as well, she probably is the one who fixes everything up in our house. So probably one for her. You reckon they'll let you put that on your, in your bags when you yeah, go back to I London? Yeah, it's probably got to stay in Melbourne for the time being, to be honest. <laughs> Maybe give it to mum as a present for yeah. letting us sit at the I front. Mean, like, mum, here's, here's a beard trimmer and, and some Milwaukee <laughs> power tools for you. Need a man in my life definitely to help out with these presents. Oh, well, now that you've got some time, you might be able to go on the dating circuit. Do you know what was funny? With... I was thinking of bringing you some things in today from like my career and I was like, there would have been such a different balance. Oh, yeah. Because I've had, I've, like we've got... Um, Obviously, Nick Nat and Daisy Thomas wrote children's books, and I was like, it would have been such a different balance <laughs> of gifting, bringing you those books. That'd be like the third book I've read if I had read one of them. I don't good like books, reading. so one's about potty training. Oh, we might need some of that. But um, actually, probably whilst we're on gifts, I brought you something. What have you got for me? So, a bit, bit rogue, but back in the day when you were at Frio, someone decided to make singlets. <laughs> <laughs> do you remember this? Yeah, I do, yeah. And I don't remember how or where it kind of came about, but somebody made Tommy Sheridan singlets. Well, anyway, I was uh, <laughs> <laughs> for some reason I was uh I was you still got I it. That's a my, was, I found this in the drawers and uh <laughs> there's a Tommy T train singlet that, that I once so upon a time had. Sorry, it's not ironed, but Oh, that is somebody good. was making fan wear of you, mate, and you know what? You can keep this oh, one. You don't want you it can, anymore. You, can, you know what? You should sign that and put that here. I'm not putting that up on the wall. That is so funny. Oh, I can't even remember. I think it, oh, this is this is hilarious. You've still got it, which is- um, Why don't you sign it for me and I'll frame it up. Oh, there you go. The yeah, tea train. Maybe the give tea it a, train. Maybe give that an eye and it's, it's a bit- it's, looking it's, like, it's a bit, yeah, it's gone through the wars. Maybe you put it in the dunny and pissed on it. Look how yellow it is. I think it was my fake tan t-shirt to oh, be fair, wow. but anyway, there that you go. That is so funny. The tea train merch. I still never forget Seppo. He, he's, a, he's a Frio- um, He's a Frio cheer squad and one day he made a big T train banner and oh I was only God. like 20 games in. You can I imagine like I'm just trying to get a tackle so I don't get dropped. No more arm tackles train. Get your chest in there. Don't fun with your grand balls defense, or your defense, defense. defense. Chase Fifey's man. Yes, coach. <laughs> fucking whatever. I'll run out and there's a big T train banner with Seppo and I because oh I used God. to get around him on socials. They still do. And uh, I was just like, it rattled me, I reckon. I was like, fuck, what are they going to think oh of me? Oh my like- God, I love it. Did anyone ever make a giant face of you? 
I don't think the faces were out. Just the sign, yeah. Oh, um, the faces get me. Would have loved the faces. Yeah, face, you, a real face for a big face. Used to get around the know? crowd hard. Like I, I just used to love it. And footy, I footy fans are the best. Never got footy a chance to really give the them best. much. You know, didn't give them much. But I used to. One of my memories was we we're running around. Uh, we played Carlton in uh, Melbourne, and yeah. I was the sub. And as you know, when you play the sub, you got to do all the extra running. And I used to like, I did it every second week, right? And when you win, all the fans would stay behind. And I'll never forget, all the Freo fans stayed behind because we beat Carlton in Melbourne. And I'm doing like one lappers and geez, I'm flying around. I thought, <laughs> fuck, this is so boring. I started high-fiving all the fans around the boundary line. And the CEO came out and t- told me, guys, tell him to stop high-fiving the crowd. It's so unprofessional. <laughs> I'm running around getting me little fucking high-fives oh and God. doing me uh, extra top-up running. I think I remember you said to me, uh, like you said to at the end of the year, I think maybe it was in your exit meeting, like, oh, geez, if I got, if I got gangs bonus, for being a sub, I would have hit all my bonuses for the year. Hundred <laughs> percent, you were pretty happy with yourself. Hundred percent, that was another thing that Connor's got me in there. A little bonus, I think one of them was uh, if you were a sub. No, if you're an emergency and, and you skipped a waffle game, it actually counted on your your twelve, fourteen, six game, sixteen yeah. games played. So, big. I think we spent that one in Europe. So you'd be happy with me there. Didn't yeah. expect that one. So that Pro- was outside of the budget. Yeah, little love KPI it. KPI Pro- bonus. To the side, didn't see that one on the old on the old Excel spreadsheet. Um, thank you so much for jumping on. It has been a pleasure to get you on. We've spoken about you a lot on here. I know with Watsy and uh, Toby and Paul and anyone else out there that's an Aces listener or watches online, like we know they're probably going, who is Mel? Uh, well, they know who you are now and we can't thank you enough for being here, everything you've done for me and all your players. But good luck back thank in you. uh, London. You're back there, obviously, next week. We're going to record this and it'll come out a bit later. But... All the best with the year. Mercedes is right there. Second. Um, obviously, Red Bull is strong, but all the best. And I might hit you up with some tickets if we're over there. I think I might be in Europe uh, July. Okay. So, you know, I don't know where they are around that time, but look out. The T-Train might be coming over with his singlet on and uh, <laughs> presenting it to Lewis Hamilton. What do you reckon? You reckon the big fella would like that? Yeah, we, we might need an upgrade on that one. Oh, that, it's is, a bit, it's that, a- is, that is, this, this is disgusting, this T-shirt. <laughs> oh my. I'm glad I found it. I'm glad oh, you still have it. I know. Well, we couldn't throw it out. I know. You gave it to me. It's a treat. I'm glad you still have it. It means a lot. You get the Rixies. I get the tea train yeah. thing. Like, how good's that? <laughs> what a, yeah, and all these wonderful. I know. Them. And the beard and blade uh, tools and the um and the Milwaukee tool. Sorry. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. Good Pleasure. to catch up. Good to see you and uh, all the best. Thanks to everyone for listening. We'll see you next week for another episode of Tommy Talks. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to another episode of Tommy Talks, where you literally can't thank you enough for all your support. Speaking of support, our great mates, Milwaukee Tools. Without yours, we wouldn't be here. Milwaukee Outdoor Power Equipment gives you the power to clear, cut, and maintain the outdoors without the petrol headaches. No pull starts, no engine maintenance, no mixing petrol and oil. Book a test drive now at milwaukeetools.com.au. Milwaukee, nothing but heavy duty. And remember... Beard and Blade is your one-stop shop for all your manly grooming needs. Beard and Blade offers an extensive range of men's premium grooming products that are designed to provide a closer, smoother, and more comfortable shave. With over 90 brands available and products ranging from razors, beard oils, shaving creams to skincare and hairstyling, it's time to upgrade your shave. Visit beardandblade.com.au, Australia's number one online men's grooming company. Make the switch today to Beard and Blade. Righto, we'll see you on the next podcast.